All right. Thanks, everybody, for joining today. Uh, we alluded to this a couple weeks ago, but we have Geronimo back to give uh, another talk this term. Uh, this time, it's going to be a little bit more of a technical subject, I believe he was alluding to. And uh, this talk is specifically going to be about the NSF IRNC work that Ampath and Amlight are working on. And uh, the title is Moving Towards an, an, Autonom an Autonomic <laughs> Network Architecture. I knew I was going to have a hard time with that. Uh, I'm just going to let Geronimo explain it because he's going to do a much better job than me. So I'll throw it over to you, over to you Geronimo. Thank you, Jason. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I, I take that everyone can see my slides. I'll keep it in presenter mode so it becomes easier in case I need to do any sort of transition. Uh, for those who don't know me, uh, again, my name is Jerome Obzea. I'm IT Associate Director here at Florida International University, also the Chief Network Engineer of the MLight project. Um, there is just one disclaimer I want to do is that this presentation is about this project that is in the beginning of its second year. So there's a lot of things that are still in the planning phase. There's a lot of definitions being made. So different from the previous presentation where I talked about results, this one is more about what we're doing now and where we want to get and uh, towards the end of uh, the project, which is scheduled for 2025. Uh, none of those concepts like autonomic uh, network architecture, none of those are our concepts. And we're just taking what the community has the best and apply to some to solve some of the MLID issues that I'm gonna also present. So feel free to interrupt me if you have questions, there's a chat for that and let's have fun. So this is the, the outline of this presentation. Uh, as always, I'm gonna start with a little bit of what is MLID for those who don't know MLID talk a little bit about the network connectivity. Then I introduce the concept of autonomic network architecture and explain how that will correlate with the MLight STN architecture. So I'm gonna talk plane by plane and discuss how each plan is gonna focus on the ANA concept. Then talk a little bit about how ANA is gonna be applied in MLight and use case. Again, this is a planning use case or it's not fully implemented, but we have products right now and a little bit of a conclusion. So explaining why we think ANA is gonna help us with our mission. So starting with uh, what is MLight? MLight is a distributed academic exchange point built to enable collaboration among Latin America, Africa, and US. It's supported by the National Science Foundation, uh, OAC, and the R IRNC program under this award number, 2029-283, and it goes from 2021 to 2025. It is basically a partnership with uh, research and education networks in Latin America, in the US, Caribbean, and Africa. And uh, it's uh, something that is happening for more than 10 years now uh, that is built upon layers of trust and openness by sharing network infrastructure, infrastructure in general, and also human resources. Um, and here on the side, there are the logos of the, the participants of this MLight consortium or participating of the MLight operation. We have FIU, we have NSF, we have the Research and Education Network of Brazil, RMP, the Research and Education Network of the State of Sao Paulo in Brazil, right in NASP, formerly known as ANSP. Uh, we have the Latin America Research and Education Network, Red Clara, the Chilean Research and Education Network, Riuna the Association of Universities for Research and Astronomy, AUTA. We have uh, the Research and Education Networks in South Africa, TANET and SANRAIN, the equivalent of Research and Education Network in Florida, FLR, and one of the US Research and Education Networks in Internet too. So talking a little bit about the this 2021-2025 20, MYEXP project, um, the goals, right? So first, the vision is to continue enabling collaboration among researchers and network operators in Latin America, Africa, and US, by providing reliable, sustainable, scalable, high-performance network connectivity and network services. And we have five main focus uh, for, for this uh, time. First one is supporting SLA or service level agreement driven uh, science applications, uh, improving network visibility and management, Enable integration with uh, between them, like in the network aware science uh, science drivers. There's a lot of science drivers that ask more information about the data to make their uh, missions be accomplished. 
um, add new network and cloud services, which is pretty standard and minimize the human role in, in network operations. So the focus of this talk today is not necessarily going to all the details of each one of those. I'll be focusing more on minimize the human role in the network operation, which is behind the autonomic concept of the network, autonomic network architecture. But uh, I'm not gonna focus only on software, only on orchestration. Let me introduce the network connectivity that we have. So uh, this is the map, the most recent map of uh, the MLA connectivity. We have 600 gigabits per second of upstream capacity between the US and Latin America. And for Latin America, we have 100 gig going to Africa. We have plans under the scope of MLI to add 200 gigs to this upstream capacity in 2023. And total in terms of international uh, links uh, provided by MLI and its partners, we have a total of uh, two terabits per second. You can see here in the diagram, everything in white is part of the MLI Express. Um, everything that is in, I'm sorry, white is protected, in green is Express. Uh, and then we have in pink waves or channels that are provided by our collaborators, like such as Ready Clara and Sarah Internet in South Africa. So all this infrastructure here uh, is shared by all those communities. All those resources are available to everyone, but everything here is managed under a centralized service provisioning solution. And that's where the autonomic network, uh, networking architecture is gonna play a key role because we wanna abstract this complexity from our community. Uh, we have multiple points of presence in Florida, Brazil, Chile, Puerto Rico, Panama, South Africa. And you can see here that there's a dash line that shows uh, that we're, we have plans and ongoing work to get to Atlanta. And just, just to show the power of collaboration that Emily has built, and the trust that was built, this is the collaboration at its finest. You can see all the links that were dedicated to this project by all those partners, uh, and each color represents a different RNE network. Um, and then we have networks that provide the dark fiber back home in cities. Every city, there's multiple data centers involved in Santiago, in Sao Paulo, in Florida, in Fortaleza. Um, and uh, there's all those links that are made available to the MLI community. So now talking about specifically the autonomic network architecture concept, I'm gonna sometimes refer to ANA, sometimes autonomic network architecture. Basically, autonomic networking architecture creates a definition design goals for a self-managed network. It's not a software, it's not a solution, it's not something that you purchase. It's, it's an architecture, it has concepts. The main thing is how do we define what is a self-managed network? It's standardized by Internet Engineering Task Force, the ITF under the request for comment 7575. The concept of autonomic system itself, it's not new. It's something that was uh, presented by IBM way back in 2001. Basically, the idea was, well, we want to eliminate all the external system from the control loop, especially humans. And there's a lot of autonomic concept when you have the autopilot on a plane, when you have a nuclear plants, uh, they are fully managed, uh, managed by the system itself, where humans only make like conflict resolution. So all of this is not new, and the idea is to bring this concept and, um, and those layers to the concept of networking in general. And self-management in this case is comprised of several self-acts properties. And those properties are those, the main ones are those four here. So self-configuration, the functions they have to configure their self, themselves. Uh, we don't want like operators or systems providing uh, configs all the time like we do it. Then you go in a router and then you uh, assign an IP addresses and management accounts and TACACs, this kind of thing. The router has to pull the information, uh, the configuration from another location. It has to identify what's its role on the network. There is the self-healing where we kind of do this in an IP networks. A lot of this IP, uh, the IP stack also already support with different names, but self-healing, if you have uh, any damage to your network or topology, then you find, if you have a fiber cut, then you find another path. This is something that the IP does with all the routing protocols. 
self-optimizing, it's the main focus of the talk today, because the idea is now that you have policies and you want to optimize your network based on those policies. And the, the policies will be something more than just restore a fiber or do like a pre-provisioning of a path. It's just like how to, you better use the resources that you have, but telling the system what you want it to be accomplished, but not necessarily saying how it has to be accomplished. Uh, and also self-protection, any system today has some sort of self-protection. So you have rate limits to the number of requests or the number of changes that you can make to a system. This is very standard. Um, so just to compare, a lot of people get confused between autonomic, automatic and automation. Uh, I put together this table just to help uh, illustrate. Uh, so starting from the left side where you have a lot of human interaction all the way to the right side where you have less human interaction. Starting with the automatic. Automatic means that you create a script, you provide the script, you provide the input, you provide the topology you provide the destination, and then your script goes against that device and does something. You can change multiple configuration and a router, for example. Um, and automation is more like when you have a playbook, they have a lot of instruction that will be performing a lot of devices. We do a lot of this with Ansible, uh, and Napalm, and all those uh, automation tools that you define what needs to be done. You, you and then you just run that against an inventory and that is applied to multiple devices at the same time. But the difference here in automatic and automation compared to autonomic, that there is no feedback from the system that you just provisioned that something didn't work uh, and then you have to take another action. It's just like in script. Obviously, if during the execution of the script, uh, things change, you can evaluate that. But once the script, the playbook is done, you don't keep waiting for feedback. You have to run it again. The closed loop orchestration tried to solve that uh, situation by running commands or running instructions or pushing instructions towards a network device or an IT system, but then keep collecting state encounters to make sure that things are running, that the state hasn't changed. For example, if there's a fiber cut, you, you're receiving a state saying that the interface is down and then you do something. You don't have to wait for a human to run another playbook to go ahead and fix it. So there's a lot of closed loop orchestration uh, in this concept of STN. Um, it is something that um, sometimes IP networks they do by themselves. And there's a lot of orchestrators out there. There's Oscars, there's OESS, there's uh, multiple uh, orchestrators that do this. The main thing is that in most of them, you still have to provide uh, very well detailed uh, policies or conditions or inventories. Uh, there's no much of a self-discovery or self-acts in this case. And, and most time there is no self-acts or self-optimization. There's a lot of self-healing, self-protecting, but not self-optimization based on policies. And this is what Autonomic wants to change uh, or propose to change is to um, give the network administrator the role of creating those policies and intents and let the devices figure that out, how they're gonna do it. Um, but still having the network operator or the administrator to like uh, have a play in conflict like resolution. Um, it, 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 and this is, uh, this is, um, the, the differences between those concepts. And we're not naive to say that AMLight is gonna become like a full autonomic architecture. We wanna get in, in the middle between closed loop orchestration with, with a little bit like a hint of autonomic. Um, and I'll explain more what that means later, but it's not part of our goal to uh, become like full autonomic or this, uh, say that we're autonomic or even develop towards having everything to be autonomic. Our goal is to minimize human interaction uh, and have the self-optimization apply to some of the functions that we have, network functions. So we wanna have autonomic functions that will perform, uh, will optimize uh, some of the network functions that we have. And I'll get back to this later. So talking about the MLight SDN architecture, it's this started in the year in the project before. Um, we had many presentations 
Most of you have heard us talking about SDN in the past. We deployed our SDN network way even before the previous product that was in 2014. And from 2014 to 2020, in fact, it's still up to 2021. We've, we always follow that the basic idea of uh, uh, SDN layers as in the RFC 7626, which we have an application layer on top that talks to two application, I'm sorry, an application plane on top that talks to two planes for control plane and management plane. And then you have at the bottom, the physical devices, which we call the data plane. Uh, the, the only thing is that because of those planes are more like concept, most of the implementation, the software that does that, like OSS, Onos, Kitos, Rio, any other like uh, Oscars, all those network orchestrators, they, they, they had all those layers as very coupled into the same code. And sometimes they have different modules. That, oh, there's a module that does the management plane, there's a module that does the control plane, but everything part of the same framework, part of the same stack, which has nothing wrong with this. Uh, it, it worked, it's still working. It's just that because the way how it was implemented. And there's a little bit of this that we want to change with the next product to facilitate this concept of ANA. The data plane was a blend of vendors uh, because we built this as uh, things were evolved. So we started with the brocade, then we added course, and then Dell switch. There is a mix of solutions, mix of support, uh, and there is a mix also the southbound interface. We had Overflow on that O and Overflow on that three. From the ANA perspective, only self healing was working. So if there is a fiber cut, there was a network outage, then the controllers, the software would find a a backup path and move the services to a different route. And the source of truth, the database where all the requests that come from the environment or from the users was like, all of that was stored within the, the SDN controllers, the software database. So if the database was not modeled to be generic enough uh, in terms of storing data, and you need to add an extra data, like for example, the contact of the owner or the birthday of the owner of that service, then you needed to have like external repository, like that is uh, Excel spreadsheet or Google Docs or or any other some, uh, sort of uh, uh, database. So it, it was not very integrated, was not considered, but again, that worked and it still works. The reason why I'm bringing this up is because uh, for this project, we decided to take uh, this ANA concept that we, we felt right away that we needed more planes or more layers to this, uh, this architecture. And this is where we create these specialized components that would operate in a different SDN plane. So we create this documentation plane for the source of truth that would be decoupled from the control plane, decoupled from the software that does the control plane. And we chose like Netbox, a lot of people in this community uses Netbox for a variety of the reasons. Uh, and we're building plugins to be the source of truth for, for, for the things I'm gonna describe later. Uh, and the SDN orchestrator that it's called Ketos NG or new generation, it will be focused on the data plane. So we don't want the users talking directly to the software that does the control plane. We want the software, uh, the users to talk to this application, then, then document this first. And then that documentation plane will trigger all the other layers for that information. So then this en enables us to do this self-configuration approach that ANA has where the controllers just need to know where they need to get the information from, uh, but the information is gonna be hosted there. Uh, with this uh, management plane, uh, the new management plane, we I presented this before a couple of weeks ago, we're using a lot of, uh, uh, INT for, for telemetry. So instead of using SNMP or open flow counters to do the management plane and having statistics about the services as part of the same software, now we're separating this. There's a specialized software just for retrieving and gathering topology data and processing that. And with this new documentation plane documenting the policies and this new management plane very focused in per packet telemetry, we decided to create this intelligence plane that we will learn, we'll profile the network behave, behavior, uh, we'll cross that data against the policies and decide what needs to be done to optimize the topology. So then this is how you create the closed loop, uh, the self-control loop 
that ANA specifies. You have the data plane exploiting green lot information that is supported for a lot to a, towards a learning system that makes suggestions or not to the control plane. So this is the big picture. It's a very, very simplified. I know it doesn't look simplified, but this is a simplified version of how those layers interact. I'm gonna go one by one so you don't need to try to read what we have. It. But uh, one of the things that is important I want to emphasize is this concept of autonomic network architecture. It does not demand or require that you do a full deployment. It's just in a specification. You deploy as much as you need for your mission. Uh, in this case, we were going to be focused on autonomic functions. And the first autonomic function that we want to support is layer two VPN. So we support layer two VPNs. We have been doing this for both the static and dynamic for a number of years since the beginning. Now, what we wanna do is to consume the telemetry that is available by the data plane uh, and then create this closed loop. So the layer two VPNs, um, the operational layer two VPNs become fully controlled by the system. And we just have to create the policies. Um, but and another thing on the side note that we want to accomplish with this and those separations and those interfaces is to enable users to have access to all the information that their services um, are using, like topology, counters, telemetry, policies, number of events, and even maintenance windows that will affect them. So we want them to have like practically have all the information that pertains to their services. So going like plane by plane. Uh, starting with the first one, the application plan. This usually is the interface to the user. Now this is literally going to be just an interface to submit requests. So the user will just submit what they want, and that application layer will talk to the documentation plane and submit requests, right? It will also read the inventory because it needs to know what devices are available, what services are available, and read the policies to understand what can be requested by the users. Uh, and this layer, this is going to be the simplest one. The goal is make sure that the application plane has a proper interface to receive the, this kind of request. And one of the things that we want to uh, be very flexible because of our community uh, has been pushing for this is very um, flexible path computation algorithm. So we want to do something more than just metrics and bandwidth. Uh, we want to do the constrained shortest path first algorithm where the users can provide multiple restrictions or multiple metrics to find a path. And again, I'll provide more details later about this, but we also want to enable the users to have access to it for packet telemetry and also support QoS, something that we also have been doing for a number of years. In terms of network applications, uh, every time that you see this network application box, consider like layer two VPNs with integration with our goal, Sense, uh, layer three VPNs or VRF, something that we also do for, for a number of years. We have a, a lot of, uh, a number, a big number of DTNs in the topology, uh, but they are not, there's not a central orchestrator of the resource like Kubernetes in place. This is something that we want to accomplish. We do obviously IPv4, IPv6 transit, and there is an asterisk for the DOS mitigation. It was not part of the initial plan, but now, uh, with uh, all the turmoil in the, the rest of the world, we have been facing a few issues that we understand that this topology could help us uh, if time permits. Uh, in terms of documentation plane, this is the first new plane uh, that was developed uh, for MLite. The idea is here to have an interface, uh, an approach to support self-configuration for services that we offer those that I mentioned before for an inventory, especially topology inventory and for traffic engineering policies. Um, we're gonna be creating data models for some of those we have data models and we're pushing those data models towards um, to be supported by Netbox. Netbox has a great support for new plugins and we have someone that is working on this right now. And the idea is that once, once you push something to Netbox, then Netbox will trigger the consumers to receive those up retrieve those updates and act on, upon them. And in this layer, the role of a NAC is basically create the traffic engineering policies and create the inventory items and discover or approve the discovery of inventory items. Then we go to the data plane or the control plane. This again is triggered by the documentation plane. 
for self-configuration. This is a, a major transformation for us because this is the core of the provisioning activities. So this has a major role uh, in our uh, architecture. Uh, and the main thing is because we're moving from a, an environment where we had multiple open source solutions uh, on us, OESS, Floodlight, Rio, to each one develop uh, the provisioning in a specific context of the network. We are in a solution that we uh, built with the support of the open source community and the Kitos open source community. So this solution we call Kitos and Gia, there, I'll talk about it in the next slide, but basically it's a brand new SDN controller that was built from the scratch to be fully compatible with the new data plan that is the one that supports INT and a number of functionalities uh, and addresses the requirements of the our community and our science drivers for telemetry uh, pathfinding options, as I mentioned before. So basically in the control plane, we have Kitos doing the provisioning of the network services and also doing topology discovery management. And obviously the self-healing is here contained. So if there is a uh, link down or a device down or a maintenance window, those components here in this control plane will find alternatives so the service doesn't get impacted. Uh, so counter plane is for self-healing, and then the intelligence plane will be for self-optimization. So a little bit of Kitos. Uh, this, I, I think, like deserves a separate presentation here in CI Lunch and Learn, but in the future, since we're very active in this right now, uh, this is a, a SDN controller that we started developing three years ago. We released the next generation of it that is very oriented to the needs of this project. Um, I'm just going to be very brief about it. It has support for OpenFlow 1.3 and also experimental actions. A lot of the new and nicest functionalities out there are experimental based. So there are depends on the manufacturer of the ship or the solution. So then INT is one of them, as I presented in the past. So this solution is being built to support this. Um, also supports like a gRPC, which makes it kind of in the right path towards barefoot runtime or P4 runtime in the future. We have support for Ethernet private line and Ethernet virtual private line. So that means that you can encapsulate the whole port or just a VLAN on that port as integration with the network monitoring system, Zabix. It's very easy to create and deploy new applications. And we have a roadmap for this use that is supporting per flow bi-directional forwarding detection to make sure that we react to problems as fast as possible. Also supporting VLAN ranges, which is something that we receive a lot of requests. People want to, oh, I want VLAN 10 to 20. And then instead of creating 10 circuits, we then we create a range for 10 circuits. And obviously in band or per packet tele telemetry. So the first release of this new generation uh, was a couple weeks ago, February 15. And this is maintained now by FIU or RedNAS, the State of Sao Paulo Academic Network. And this is this, this new generation is just because the old Kitos was not funded by the equivalent to of NSF in Brazil. So then we decided to take the lead and then create a branch of it. And but a branch that is very focused on the needs that we have here. And you have access to this on GitHub in case you need it. So the question mark is, uh, we don't have the logo yet. So the, the logo you see here is the previous one. Uh, we're very proud that the, the, the Kitos effort, we were part of that since the beginning, but now since the project changed, we have to come up with a new logo. Uh, in terms of data plane, data plane gets instruction from the control plane and exports the telemetry to the man management plane is the second major transformation compared to the previous project because now we're, we're standardizing like the devices we want to use because we work with the manufacturer of those devices to make sure that they work for our needs. So the main thing, as I presented again a couple of weeks ago, we're going towards this Novi Flow switch, which is the Tofino ASIC switch, uh, primarily supported by Foxconn and Agicore. Uh, it has 32 100 gig ports per switch. It has a virtual machine inside. So if you want to do a little bit different something, it's possible. It supports OpenFlow 1.3, 1.4, and P4 runtime, P4 and barefoot runtime for, for southbound. 
But the main thing is right away, it supports INT. Uh, that's the thing that we're looking the most. And all the legacy devices that we had in terms of routers, we replaced by Juniper MX 204s. The optical layer, we got rid of uh, the 35, uh, 6500, the Sienna 6500. Now we have Sienna Wave servers. Basically, we only have a lot of point to points. We don't have a complex uh, optical layer uh, or photonics layer. It's just a bunch now of point to point, but those devices also support telemetry. So uh, we're working with Sienna since 2020. Uh, we even got a publication how we're going to do this in the future, but basically we wanted the switches to send telemetry every every five minutes. Uh, we're trying to uh, like uh, narrow it down to thirty seconds to give us the all the data from the optical layer, like a prefact, postfact, all of that to to um, anticipate packet loss. So this is the focus that we have right now. But at this point, we're only using the REST API. And this new topology saved us a lot of money in terms of collocation and power costs, uh, because uh, all the devices here are one rack unit. Most of them don't even use like 450 watts uh, compared to those Juniper 480 or Brocade MLX seed boxes that each one was using like almost 3000 watts. So this is, is a major improvement for us. Uh, the management plane, uh, I'm going to be brief about this because uh, I presented this before. The video to the INT collector, it's here. Uh, it's also part of the CI Lunch and Learn series. We also, one of the things that is not in the figure here that we added was the Juniper telemetry interface solution. Uh, so we're doing the telemetry in the routers and, and the switches. Uh, we're continuing using NASFlow. SNMP, uh, syslog, those are still very helpful. Um, and the idea is that this component here called optical packet telemetry collector, OPTC, is gonna be like providing, will be summarizing all that telemetry and exporting to the intelligence plane network states that are like only when there are changes, something that requires the, uh, the like, requires the intelligence plane to do something. So this is going to be centralized by this component here, OPTC. But again, if you haven't seen the INT collector presentation, this is a key component uh, of this framework. I suggest you go there uh, on, the, on YouTube and uh, the ESNet web page. So the intelligence plane, so this is the one that gets the inventory, the policies and the services from the documentation plane. It gets telemetry report from the management plane. It profiles the MLI traffic every 100 to 500 milliseconds. That's customizable. We will discover performance issues and traffic anomalies. And then we'll make suggestions to the control plane to steer traffic, load balance services or rate limit anomalies. Anomalies. So, uh, and obviously we'll notify the network management system. Uh, in the end, we'll notify the NOC. So this is the final component of this architecture. We came from the application, documentation, control plane, data plane, management plane. Now we go back, go up to the intelligence and the intelligence plane will notify the control plane. So this is when the learning will be uh, I'm not talking about sophisticated machine learning algorithms right now. We're talking about observation based on the telemetry that we got. There is enough uh, for us to start doing this because a lot of the things we're looking for is to do like react in a very fast pace, like a sub second pace to support those science drivers that are SLA driven or real time. So there's not going to be, uh, well, there, there is a possibility of having sophisticated um, machine learning algorithms, but most of the things will be very direct to the point. And this is uh, the role of this component that we're developing, the Behavior Anomaly Performance Manager, or the BAPM. The BAPM is the software that will operate in multiple layers, will operate inside the exchange point, inside the MLite, but also will support external provisioning tools for interdomain that are interested in per service telemetry which is a subject to another presentation, but there's a project that we're also working called STX. We're gonna present that one later. Uh, so example of policies that if you have 80 plus percentage of uh, bandwidth utilization for more than two seconds, so this is part of the policy, you can do something. 
if you have 50 or more percentage of a queue occupancy for more than two seconds, or if the number of paths changes more than five times in the last two hours. So those are just examples. I'll provide more examples once we go in the use case. So talk, speaking of the use case, let's see how ANA would uh, be applied to MLite and is and focus on the layer two VPN as I mentioned before. So the, our goal is- So before you, uh, before you get into that one, I think that there's a, a good time to break for a question that's been in the chat room. Uh, this is a slightly longer question, so uh, it's going to take me a minute to, to read it here. Uh, so Luciano pointed out that the community has been working on, on this concept for quite some time. Uh, these self-chop uh, concepts uh, used to face a lot of resistance from network operators because of culture, fear of losing understanding of what is going on. Uh, did this resistance diminish along the years? Are we ready for this? Or is this architecture accompanied by uh, explainability components, which provide operators with an adequate level of understanding of what is going on within the network? Okay, so this is a great question. Thank you, Luciano. Um, the community is becoming more open to this. Uh, I'm not saying that people still like want to do this right away. I never did a survey. Uh, I only participated of a few discussions about this. But this, the same conflict we had at the beginning where we start talking about SDN, right? Uh, again, SDN is a concept, not as an implementation, not an open flow, but SDN. It's a concept of having a centralized orchestrator managing your resources. And Although a lot of people criticize this, a lot of companies criticize this, many companies came back with their own solutions, like Cisco has one, ACI, Jennifer has one, um, many like Brocade purchase, like closed a part of uh, the open daylight and did that. And ESNAT uses Oscars, Internet to uses OESS, the solutions that they built. Um, and they are getting comfortable with that. So they're seeing that there is value in this. Uh, the only thing that we're doing with the autonomic is now taking this to the next level. Yes, there is an intimidation. That's the reason we don't want to do the full spectrum of A and A. We're focusing on one autonomic function. And from there, from that experience, we're going to learn. We still have visibility of everything, right? Everything, all the data, it's ours. Uh, all the control, it's in our hand because it's always the role of the administrator, the final say. You can just delegate this to the system or you can get involved. And every time there is a conflict, then is the role of the administrator the place is the, the final word is ours. So uh, you can do this in a very like slow pace and accommodate your needs. Uh, just like we did, we spoke about this in the beginning of STN multiple times. Don't try to do everything that STN tells you to do it. Uh, just solve one problem. Right, and then from that problem, you decide what you want to do next. So I think uh, there is uh, the community is more open to this right now, but I wouldn't know uh, what kind of percentage changed from the moment that this discussion started to now. I would I just say that there is a lot of people now that are more open to the idea. Uh, moving on. So I think yeah, okay. Uh, let me know, Luciana, if you have a follow-up comment to that. So again, talking about the first autonomic function, uh, in this case, we want to do this for layer two VPN, the topology manager. Uh, so, okay, so this is the first step, okay? Before, let's say that before user asks for anything, there's that phase where you're preparing the environment, whether self-configuration, where the policies are being submitted. So before anything, before layer two VPNs are available, then you have to document the data models, the application layer has to, to read that. You need to do like a topology discovery. You need to know what resources you have. The NOC has to approve. The, you, the NOC has to submit the policies and those policies have to be also available to the application. And in the moment that we create the inventory, and the policies, those have to be provided to the BAPM, to the intelligence plane, because that one needs to uh, be prepared for what's coming next, okay? So again, examples of policies, uh, an average utilization over two minutes that should be less than 65% of a link capacity. Um, or you can define layer two VPNs with higher priority, it shouldn't be moved. 
uh, only layer two VPNs with up to uh, only move layer two VPNs up to three times every 10 minutes. Don't move layer two VPNs to have opt out for no protection. So there's a lot of things that you can accommodate with those policies. It's not part of the plan uh, before anyone asks. It's not part of the plan to create a natural language for the policies. It's not a natural, it's like not part of the plan to create a sophisticated documentation or sophisticated representation of those policies. Now, we're going to simplify here. The, the easiest way that we can accomplish this, we're going to do it. And we're always going to be building upon that and learning from that, but we don't want to dedicate to, uh, too much in how to specify a policy. We have a number of policies in mind, uh, and we're going to stick to that format right now that is it's very low level. Um, so then the first, then the network is ready, the topology is ready. Let's go to the user. The user makes a request. Like that request go through the application plane that submit the request to the documentation plane. Uh, let's say Netbox. Netbox saves that, that request with all the metadata that we need uh, and all the data that we need for that service. And then we push this to the APM, to the intelligence plane. So it gets ready that there's this, let's say this VLAN is coming and submit a request to Kitos for provisioning or um, to do the proper network configuration. So Kitos in this case would submit the instructions to the data plane and, and that's, that's the part for the provisioning. After the provisioning is done, the data plane now starts exporting telemetry, right? So let's say that this is not the first layer to VPN ever, or let's say that it is the first one. So then telemetry is gonna start being exported. So INT will report traffic for that uh, the, uh, traffic, then the devices will export the normal legacy telemetry data. That data, in case there's a change, then the network state is pushed to the BAPM. So since there's only one VLAN, let's put an example. Let's say that there's the user sports are 100 gig and there is a 40 gig link in the metal. So it's not the case of MLite, but let's give this an example. So if the users start pushing for 100 gig, they are gonna be covered to 40. That means that that port will start having buffering. That port will have 100% utilization. Now it's time for the intelligence plane to do something. Uh, and that something could be, uh, we could be notified the knock that there is a, there is a port that is using more than 65% utilization for the last two minutes but also could be an action. In our case, we want this to be an action. So the action would be uh, maybe move that VLAN to now an 100 gig link, right? So if we have link available, let, or let, we have an option available, let's move to that one. Maybe that one was not properly provisioned the first time, or maybe let's do a cap, let's uh, filter at the, the source port for 40 gig or 30 gig. So the 40 gig port doesn't become like 100% utilization. And then we leave some space for, for other users to share. So there's a possibility of things that you can do it. Uh, let's say that the link also that port that has 100% utilization had other VLANs. So then you can move some of the VLANs out of that port, distribute the traffic, do some sort of load balance. So there is a number of possibilities that you can define. And then again, the control plane, we retrieve the metadata, we compute the path, and then we push the flows to the data plan to um, apply the policy that you created. So, and then this is the final picture. Once the first loop is done, then you're gonna be doing this for the rest of the life of the network or the service. The NOC will keep creating new policies in case there's a need for change. The, the red lines represent this closed loop orchestration. So uh, I provision, I export the limit, I learn, I reprovision. As long as we need, as long as we have problems, uh, the, this is going to be happening. The topology manager will keep discovering new links, new ports, uh, new services, new DTNs, whatever it is that is needed. The telemetry collector will keep collecting telemetry from the, the packets, from the optical layer, and so on and so forth. So, so from the scope of MLite, from the scope of our implementation, our roadmap is at the end of year two of the project is to do this loop in less than five seconds. And then do the uh, the year three, you want to do this in less than two seconds, all the way to less than 500 milliseconds uh, towards the end of year five. Why is that? Because our science driver 
uh, has a very restricted uh, data transfer uh, window that executes every four or five seconds. I presented about this in the INT presentation, uh, the Vera Rubin or LSST use case. But basically what I'm trying to say here that we wanna react as soon as possible. So if LSST sourcing packet drops, then we find and fix the problem in less than 500 milliseconds. So they still have some time left to finish the data transfer. So this is the scope. This is how ANA is gonna be applied to MLIPE for the next five years. And again, this is focused only on self-optimization or self-optimizing. I didn't talk about all the services. I didn't talk much about the infrastructure, but this is the idea of, of how we are gonna implement ANA at MLIPE. So, and then you might say, well, so again, it's, it's still very confusing. How will ANA support our goals? Uh, translate all of this that you said. So MLite has many links. I, I mentioned this before, we have 600 gig, we're going towards 100 gig, 80, 800 gigs of upstream capacity from the US to Latin America. And then that means all those links are 100 gigs at this point. So that means that we have eight links, possible ways of getting from Latin America to the US. But if you take in, into consideration just from Chile to Jacksonville, using all the links, there are 25 possible paths to take to get from LSST to, towards the destination, which is Slack. So uh, this is only including MLIP, right? So if you just go with, oh, I, I'm gonna go with the metric that is bandwidth utilization, or I'm gonna go with the metric there is number of hops, you're not gonna make good use of the 25 possible path for all the services that come from Chile to Jacksonville, where also internet two is, right? So, so uh, the idea is that you can create load balance algorithms and spread the load between all those services across all the links, not just for the LSSC, but for all the MLI flows and always respecting the user constraints and requirements. Some of those users have specific restraint. I don't wanna go through requirement A. I don't want to go through country B. I don't want to go through exchange point C. So in this case, we have to respect that. And we're going to find a path using those constraints and those requirements. So that's the reason the pathfinding that we built uh, and we're still building, like evolving, has the capability of uh, addressing so many requirements. Uh, I, I think in the end, I forgot to specify all of them, but that's in the Keto slide. I'll probably go back, but uh, this is one of the possibilities, how ANA is gonna help us. Uh, MLIT has an SLA driven packet loss intolerance, so many response time expected science driver. So it's no uh, secret that this is the Vera Rubin Observatory. Um, and the idea is with the per packet telemetry and the sub-second network profiling capabilities, then we're gonna be able to react in one, under one second, as I mentioned before. And with the optical telemetry, you wanna anticipate issues. So it's a very known to the community, the optical photonics community that unless you have a fiber cut, the devices start degrading over time. So unless there's a fiber cut, there's a major thing, then things start getting deteriorating through time. So uh, there is something called Q fact that is a composed number from the pre fact, post fact, attenuation, power, everything that you have in the fiber uh, and the substrate, the optical substrate, that it shows you that you're leading, like walking towards a failure. So if we can map this in advance, and then steer the traffic out of that port, out of that infrastructure, then we'll avoid packet loss. And, and this is one of the things we want. Uh, and also, yeah, it's a very cultural thing. The MLight engineering team prefers to focus on engineering and not manual activities. There's a lot of the, a lot of the activities today that we do that are manual even with the SDN in terms of moving stuff around and doing load balance because we, do, we, we don't have algorithms to do the self-optimization, right? We only have algorithm, algorithms to do self-healing. Um, so sometimes you're gonna see on the map that there, we have so many links, but only one or two have a lot of utilization. Most of the others are empty. So this is part of uh, this concept, the effort of doing this manually. Um, so this is the scope of the presentation. Again, this is still at the beginning of uh, year two. If you look at from the perspective of people that were recruiting, we're still at the end of year one, 
because most people, most of the developers start working in the quarter three or less here. We still have a long road, but we have products. We release the OpenFlow, I'm sorry, the STM controller kitos. We release the INT collector. So we have some products that the community can start seeing some actions and seeing that we're getting traction towards this goal. So I hope it was helpful and let's go to questions now. All right, well, thank you very much, Geronimo. Uh, just as a, a follow on to the, the earlier question, uh, for those that are not monitoring the chat, uh, uh, Julio did put a link to an article that uh, explains in detail a little bit more about uh, what that uh, question and, and answer was, uh, was going on about. Uh, it talks about the RFCs and, and things of that nature. And then Luciano did follow up with, uh, as a minor suggestion, having an explicit explainability component, which would still distill and reason on the pieces of information that are generated and maintained by the different architectural components. Okay, yeah, that's a good suggestion. Thank you. And Miriam has another question here. Uh, you mentioned self-optimizing. Are there a number of objective functions you are optimizing? And uh, if so, what are these? Okay, so uh, one of the things, focus on uh, at the end of the presentation, one of the things we wanna do is to make sure that all the links that we have that could be used by our community to get used by the community. So all the links that don't have problems or the links that respect that user requirements to get used, uh, um, to like to do some sort of load balance, but based on the bandwidth, not just like spreading layer two VPNs. And we want to do load balance based on the utilization of the network infrastructure. So this is one of them. The other thing that we want to avoid is having uh, interfaces with high buffer, high buffer utilization or buffer occupancy. So in case we start seeing that there's interfaces that are always getting to like more than one megabyte of buffering, we want to start load balance, whatever resources we have on that interface. This is one of them. With the key occupancy, it goes to the, uh, the jitter and hop delay. So if you start seeing that there's a lot of hop delay in one part of the network, because this is called by buffering, then we want, also want to do like some sort of load balancing. Um, yes, so we want to better use our network resources and make sure that if we, the main goal for all of this is to lower packet drops as much as possible, not packet loss, packet drops. Packet drops are packets that we intentionally drop it because we're running out of memory, right? Uh, and those are the things that are usually driven by the memory of the equipment plus the QoS policies we have. Since we have a huge diversity of links and paths from, the, uh, from those countries, then we want to minimize those packet drops by using all the resources that are available. So this is the main thing that we want for this. I know Marian is very interested in doing this uh, TCP profiling. This is one of the things uh, we want to do it and we want to do it with you. Uh, we have had this discussion multiple times. This um, specifically for the LSST, for the Vero being one of the things we want to do is to track the TCP performance and start correlating that with the performance that not just the, the performance that they see, but the performance with the infrastructure that we have at that point to understand, well, is that performance bad because of us or is something else, right? So if the, let's say there's a user that has an 100 gig port and it's only get like 20 gigabit per second, then we're gonna look at, oh, this doesn't look right because he's coming from a 100 gig port going to a 100 gig port. So he should be capable of that. Uh, I'm just assuming because I don't know the first or last mile, but I'm gonna let me take a look at my infrastructure. Do I see any bottleneck? Do I see any buffering? Do I see pack a loss? Do I see pack a drops? If I don't see anything, that means that it's not caused by me, or at least not it's not that explicit that is caused by me. So this is one of the things we want to accomplish is to correlate the performance that the user see, the quality of experience to the infrastructure that we support to try to see, oh, look, it's not our fault because we get pointed like fingers a lot. Any other questions?
how are you implementing the policies? Do you have a special template language? No, no. <laughs> uh, so Joe, uh, at this point, uh, most of the policies are manually uh, coded, right? So we create functions to run the policies and then you just populate the variables of that function. Uh, why is that? Because when you're running uh, in Ben and White telemetry, you get like millions of packets per second. You don't have the flexibility of keeping make, like making those packets available to the user space to be processed in a very sophisticated processing. So you have to process this at the NIC or in a very low level of the Linux kernel. So you don't have a lot of flexibility for a uh, number of functions. You only have like 4,096 assembly instructions to do it. So most of the computation that we do is, is we create the function that do the math and you just provide the variables or link A bandwidth, that amount, that many seconds, and that's it. So at this point it's very limited. That's the reason the scope of uh, acting for those policies is very small. But we're working towards the scalability of the telemetry solution so we can have something a little bit more sophisticated in terms of uh, learning. And, and that's, uh, that's not part of the scope uh, of this project, uh, but it's something that we see that can be accommodated. You're welcome. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much, Geronimo, for another great talk uh, and good conversation and questions from everybody. Uh, send me your slides when you get a chance. I'll make sure I get those posted along with the video. And just for anybody who's still listening out there, we did have one scheduling change. Uh, Garin's talk that was going to be on uh, the full stack view of Jupyter and Kubernetes uh, is being pushed one week. So it is not going to be next week. It'll be April 1st instead. Uh, we'll make sure we send out the updated schedule. Uh, so thanks again to everybody who joined today. And we have a one-week break, and we'll pick up again in, uh, on the 1st of April. So everybody have a good weekend. Thank you, Jason. Thank you all. Bye.